Hi everyone, today I'm with Siri Hustbet. We are very happy to have her as our guest speaker for the opening ceremony of the IPA 52nd Congress on the Infantile and its Multiple Dimensions that will be held online in July. As you know, Siri is a renowned author. She has published seven novels, four books of essays, and a book and a work of nonfiction. She has a PhD in English literature from Columbia University. She's a lecturer in psychiatry at Well Cornell Medical College in New York City and has received numerous awards, including one that I think it's very important is the to, to 2019 Princesa de Asturias or Princess of Asturias Award. Siri, we want to thank you for giving us this time to have this conversation ahead of our your presentation during the Congress on July 21st. I would like to open this interview by referencing Donald Meltzer, who said that the psychoanalyst is closer to the artist than to the scientist. It is the artist who is in contact with the chaotic. They talk to us about chaos, but they don't get lost in it. So uh, the artist looks, you know, in two directions, the chaos and the world, and their creative gesture articulates them. So Siri, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts about this. In fact, you know, the link between psychoanalysis and art and about the influence or of our creative aspects and the infantile on psychoanalysis and on literature as well. Uh, you know, what does, the, what does the artist do, right? How do we think about it? I think for me anyway, it's very important to think about it also as an embodied process right mm. that it's coming from very mm. deep places in a human being and it's creating some kind of object whether it's a book a piece of music you know um a sculpture painting. or a painting any kind of dance um is that this is a uh rhythmic process that comes out of the body i think you can relate it to very early life because we all establish rhythms with that important other or others you know the people who are caring for us when we're uh little and you know i've been interested in the work of daniel stern who came out um of suzanne langer really his ideas are very dependent. What he did was he shifted um, uh, Langer's insights about art making. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. About art making onto the relation between uh, the mother and child and the music, if you will, um, uh, that's established between them. These repetitive patterns that create a kind of whole. Um, he was very uh, clear about that, that, and then they repeat themselves, but there is a kind of beginning, middle, and an end, just the, the way there are in stories. And that's the underground, or what he called the pre-narrative envelope. Um, and this, to me, is, a, is, is a, quite a profound idea. I'm interested in both Blanger and Stern, so that we do not limit creativity to merely um you know linguistic symbols right this this is um, important creativity or our ability to speak or to write it's not limited to the language but also when she studied the origins of language regarding the music of the of yes. the of the way the mother, you know, 
speech or the or the sounds and the music. The language has a music. And I like very much what you said about the rhythm. It has to do with the, an analytic process, a rhythm, you know? Yes. It, it and those are, and you know, so I think you it's important to me, and this is something <clears throat> I continue to work on in my thinking life, if you will, is the connection between all these different kinds of rhythms, right? We are rhythmic beings and we are in states of continual flux, right? Even though our, these biological uh, uh, rhythms are stable, if they're not stable, <laughs> we die, right? But yeah. nevertheless, they're, they're dynamic. So if you think about very simple things like heartbeat, um, you know, uh, breathing, uh, this is very deep, but then there's more, the human walk, the human gait, which is something um, I've, I've written about in relation to making art. Um, a lot of writers walk, or if you're stuck, get up and walk, it, it unsticks you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good way to jog a thought is simply to have some motor activity and to get yourself going. Um, Virginia Woolf used to compose as she walked, and um, she was insistent uh, in a letter to Vita Sackville West, she wrote that, you know, rhythm was primary, and then you made the words to fit in. And this is a very deep, I think, understanding about creative process. There's another quote that I, have shortened considerably, but um, Einstein was asked um, by Jacques Hadamard, the famous mathematician, mm. how he worked, what, what, what his work was all about. And I'm shortening him now, but basically he says that um, his work was about um, visualizing. Ah emotion and muscularity in other words motor moving and i thought that you know is not only i think an insight into einstein's working process but into the working processes of all creative people which is why it's often rather difficult for writers for example to answer the question that sometimes comes up you know, where do your ideas come from, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because, well, we don't really know. Um, but I have proposed, and I think this links importantly to psychoanalysis, is that when I'm writing the, the story that I'm making, does not have to relate to actual experiences um, that I've had, literal experiences, but it has to be emotionally true. Mm -hmm. And it has to be in the right rhythmic formation. I mean, I can always feel the beats of the prose when they're wrong, they have to, they have to get changed. Um, and that every work, um, has a rhythmic form. I think this is true in visual art, even though it doesn't move. Um, and that John Dewey is probably one of the best people in this. <laughs> he talks about the, the, the American pragmatist philosopher, he talks about exactly that, that you use, he has a beautiful phrase, the rhythmic crises of, um, of living, of being alive, and mm. shape them into a form. Uh, this is quite close to the mysterious business that is being in, a, in an analysis, which I have. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those people, which is that things happen, and you know that they are happening through this connection, through this special form of dialogue, um, but that 
the transformations that are possible happen not just through understanding, right? Not just because you can denote what is being said, say in an interpretation. It's because suddenly the interpretation or the back and forth or whatever has happened is embodied and felt. Then change is possible. Then change works. And um, I do think that the patterns that we were talking about earlier, these rhythmic patterns that are become part of us, right? And then they become part of the habit body. <laughs> what Meryl yeah. Quincy calls the habit body, right? You're not deeply, I think artists might be more aware of these rhythms than other people because we're always working with them in some way, but nevertheless, it's hard to describe what they are. And of course, some of them, uh, some of them are not good for us, right? Some of them create fear and cacophony mm -hmm. and they're, you know, bad feelings that are frightening, which then I think Winnicott has the most wonderful uh, way of thinking about this is that some of his patients had to learn how to play. Yes, you are right. And this is, I think that you gave us a beautiful, I don't like to say explanation because you are not teaching, but you conveyed the way you feel the creative process and and the and it has to do with what Beyond called, you know, uh, learning from experience. You have yeah. to experience. It's not an intellectual, only an intellectual, you know, work you do in analysis. That's why I think that the, the infantile, the title of uh, our Congress is very important because there is, you know, in current days, uh, there is a tendency to get rid of the infantile. And if you get rid, I don't know why, but there is a kind of race to success. I don't know what it means. <laughs> I don't know what success means. I must confess, I don't know. But you know, the price you pay is to lose contact with your infantile that contains the most creative and joyful. Of course, there are fears and, and everything, but to, to get to, to recover the contact with, with this possibility to be creative. No, I totally agree. I think um, that, you know, we live in a culture um, that has embraced neoliberalism, right? And mm -hmm. that embrace has meant um, a rather brutal, I think, understanding of what people are. And it's one I resist very strongly, which is this, you know, competitive, individualistic uh, race to the top <laughs> idea of, you know, of, of success. Um, and it depends, I think, on a certain uh, passivity on the part of many people in the culture, right? That they're passive, they feel um, that there's nothing they can do about what's happening, that, you know, power exists in these elite places and they're just unable to change anything, which makes people very angry. And yes, they lose touch with uh, creativity. And also, I think the power of resistance. And as we are still going through, you know, this difficult yes. time of the pandemic, I'm, and, and it's, it is very important to be able to think about these kind of things because this is in, in some way we still live in different parts of the world in, in a, you know, in a difficult reality. Absolutely. We are stuck in a way, but it gives some opportunity to think and to learn more. So thank you very much for giving us your time and we will meet.
very soon. When yes. You give your, your opening lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Virginia. It was really nice talking to you.